Welcome back to Let's Code. Now, Bevy Rapier 2D hasn't been updated for 0.9 yet. There is a PR open that will allow that to happen, but it has not been merged. And perhaps more importantly, the Bevy ECS LDTK library that we use in the 2D platformer is also not ready yet for Bevy 0.9. Although I do think the underlying Bevy ECS tile map is. So I opened up the 2D platformer to clean up some code and get ready for the 0.9 update. And I found out that there's a new character controller in Bevy Rapier 2D. There was a release that I wasn't paying attention to, and it means that we can delete quite a bit of our custom code when it comes to ground detection specifically, but also other things. So you can see me just kind of uh, doing a little jump here, moving my character back and forth. The movement is a little bit jerky because I haven't quite figured out how to best take advantage of this new character controller yet. But you can see that we do actually get some action out of it. We can move left and right, we can jump, we can do whatever. So we'll get into uh, my messy version of this code in a little bit. But first I wanna cover the character controller itself because the character controller itself is probably what you are most interested in. So to clarify what Rapier means by a character controller, they're referring to something that is slightly higher level than just a raw kinematic body or a custom set of colliders and rigid bodies and whatever else you wanna put on that allows you to control a character more like you would in a game. Now, this doesn't automatically receive input for you, so you're still gonna to have to wire up your controllers or whatever else you want to happen. It's not going to automatically implement jumping for you, but it does include built-in behavior for things like ground detection, which is code that we had to write ourselves in the past for this 2D platformer example. So to get into the character controller, there's basically two ways you can choose to control a character in your game. In this case, I'll be using the example of a 2D platformer. You can either set the rigid body to dynamic or you can set it to kinematic. Dynamic means it will interact with the world. If something bumps into it or it bumps into something, those two things will bounce off of each other in certain ways. Gravity is applied. And in general, you get less control over where the character is at any given time. Kinematic bodies exist because the way that a character gets controlled is often very different than the way that an NPC or an enemy or something else gets controlled. The more straightforward examples of kinematic bodies include things like floating platforms, elevators, or of course, the more complicated playable characters. And the important thing to note is that they're immune to forces or impulses, which we were using forces to control our dynamic rigid body for our character controller in previous examples. So that input for us is going to have to change. But this control does come at a price. We do now have to manually detect and react to any collisions that are happening. We do have to manually figure out where the character is supposed to be or where we want to put it. For example, when we're doing ground detection, we may have to set up sensors or ray casts ourselves to figure out whether the character is actually on the ground or not. And that's what the kinematic character controller does for us. It's a higher level tool that takes these extra ray casts or shape casts or trajectories and gives us higher level tools for dealing with more complicated situations such as ground detection, such as inclined planes, and other things. So then we get a description of what Rapier is trying to achieve with this character controller. First, it allows us to easily stop at obstacles. So if you run into a wall, you want the character to stop. You don't want the character to bleed into that wall because you did the collision calculation wrong. This is an extremely common failure case, which you can see in many examples that have been done with Bevy and Rapier specifically but also in other engines. The Rapier character controller allows us to slide on slopes that are not too steep. Dealing with slopes and where the character should be and whether they can, for example, jump off of a slope or not is fairly complicated to figure out. So it's nice to have that feature inside of this character controller. Climbing stairs and walking over obstacles, I'm going to bucket into the same category. This is kind of like if you've ever made a rectangle collider and you've had a tile-based 2D platformer, you may have noticed that those two colliders, the rectangle for the character and the rectangle for each tile in the level, can end up colliding when you're walking past them, stopping your character. Walking over obstacles and climbing stairs are two examples of this happening when you want it to. So if you are walking into a tile that is a stair tile 
and the first stair is one third of the height of a tile, you may want that character to be able to automatically, by holding just the right direction, walk up that stair set. That's what this is for. It's for automatically walking up those small pieces. And then of course, interacting with moving platforms can be its own deal of complexity because you have to actually handle things like, what does your character do if it's on top of the platform? If the platform moves and your character's on top of it, how does it stick to that platform? When does it release? Will this platform throw your character or drop it right where it's standing? So while the character controller in Rapier is fairly basic, does cover a significant amount of complicated use cases that you would otherwise have to figure out how to do yourself. And for that reason, right at the end of the introduction for the character controller, they say, if this doesn't work for you, don't hesitate to take the code that comprises this character controller, copy it into your project and modify it to do whatever you need it to do. So this is both an 80% use case kind of thing and also a kind of boilerplate starting point for more complicated use cases. The kinematic character controller is a component that you can add to your entities. This is the approach that I took in the 2D platformer example that I just showed you, but there are other ways to use this functionality, such as the move shape on the rapier context. We'll be continuing to talk about the component-based way of interacting with the character controller. So the character controller has to be attached to the same entity as a transform. You either have the option of setting a custom shape for the collider or attaching a collider component to your entity as well. If you attach a collider component, the character controller will pick up on that collider and use it. Every frame, the way that we get to interact with the character controller is to modify the translation field, which is a VEC2 in our example, because we're using a 2D platformer. So we update the translation, which is going to be basically a diff from where the character currently is. So if you want it to move one unit to the right, you would have X B one, for example, after we use that frame update to update the translation, the physics engine takes over and says, okay, let's take that translation and try to apply it within the physics world. More specifically, it takes that translation and tries to apply it to the entities transform component. After this physics update happens, we can get the resulting data with the kinematic character controller output component which is automatically inserted to the same entity that has the kinematic, kinematic character controller component. This output component, as we'll find out later, has things like whether the character is grounded or not. So then they give us a nice little example to really give this a concrete view. We can initialize our game, as it were, by spawning in an entity with a kinematic position-based rigid body, a collider that's shaped like a ball with a radius, and the kinematic character controller default settings. Inside of our update system, which we'll be running all the time, we'll query for any of the character controllers that exist. In this case, it's going to be just the one that we've put in. And each time we're gonna move the translation by one in the X direction and negative 0.5 in the Y direction. So this is gonna start moving us in sort of a forward and downward angle. And note that this applies every frame. So every frame we will set that translation to another incremental change of one negative five. And then in a different system, we could read the output. We can read the entity ID from our query and do things like check to see whether the character is grounded or not, which can be useful for detecting whether our character should be able to jump or not. While you can use any arbitrary collider for your character controller, they do suggest using a cuboid, a ball, or a capsule because they involve fewer computations and fewer numerical approximations. This is the same advice that you would find if you were looking for what collider should I make my 2D platform character. So it's the same advice you would get anywhere. The character controller does not support rotational movement. It only supports translations. One of the features of the character controller is that it comes with a small offset that's based around the collider that you've set up. Now, while you can modify this gap, you probably shouldn't. This gap is supposed to be small enough to be unnoticeable but large enough to avoid numerical precision issues. This helps with problems like we were talking about earlier where your character can seem to get stuck between tiles. You do get to define the vertical and horizontal axis by defining what the up vector should be. This is important for when we start talking about slopes on the floor and how we'll determine how heavy that slope is for the angle of the floor. The character controller comes with default support for slopes and specifically sliding down slopes that are too steep. This is done by specifying 
the angle that is too large, as well as the angle that is small enough to walk up. As we talked about earlier, when we talked about the automatic step up for stairs, you can enable an auto step setting that allows a character to climb stairs automatically or walk over very small obstacles. This is really interesting because while there are some obvious settings like maximum height the character can step over, there's also some less obvious settings like the minimum horizontal width. So on top of the obstacle, if the character is teleported and then isn't able to move by a distance that is larger than the minimum width, then the character will just be stopped by the obstacle instead of being teleported on top of it. And you can disable auto-stepping for dynamic bodies, or rather enable auto-stepping for dynamic bodies, in case you want to be able to push the small things around. There are some really nice graphics on this page for successful and unsuccessful auto-stepping, so I encourage you to go take a look at those if you are more of a visual person. Snap to ground is a feature that is super useful for walking off of small ledges or walking on curved surfaces. So if you're, say, on the top of something that looks more like a sphere or more of an, a curved surface and you walk off of that middle point, you want your character to be pushed down into that surface or snapped to the ground. And there are some good visualizations here for this as well. So in the right-hand case, your capsule might be able to move left faster than gravity will snap it to the ground. So if you enable this snap to ground functionality, it will pull you into this ground as long as you're not too far away from it, allowing you to have a character that moves along a curved surface smoothly. The same can happen for small ledges, where if the ledge is small enough, you will get pulled down into the ground on the next level. Rapier has a rich functionality for filtering out different kinds of collisions. So if there's anything that you don't want your character to pay attention to, those filter flags and filter groups are also available. The advanced features of stepping or sliding or snapping to ground and whatnot can happen after a character has actually hit something. So your character could actually hit the small ledge before it went over, for example. And those collisions are automatically collected into the output.collisions. So that's the kinematic character output component that we talked about earlier on the collisions field. And finally, gravity is no longer something that affects our kinematic body, so we are now responsible for handling gravity, or at least any downward component of our force. So if we move over to the code that I've written here, we have two major systems that I want to talk about. The jump system, which is the vertical axis, and the horizontal system, which is controlling the horizontal axis. The first thing I want to note is that the output.grounded field from the kinematic character controller output component has now completely replaced our ground detection system entirely. So we just deleted that code, which is fantastic because I didn't want to maintain that. <laughs> I don't want to maintain any code that I don't have to maintain. Now, I haven't done anything like start to implement a state machine here. So this code is going to be both messy and not a great example for you to copy. <laughs> I don't quite know whether having this separate jump for the vertical and horizontal movements is going to pan out well with this new character controller because everything that we have to work with gives us a VEC2. So let's start with the horizontal. Our player has the kinematic character controller default settings. So in our horizontal system, we're using leaf wing to pull in a set of actions that are the platformer actions. In this case, we're using right and left. So we iterate over those actions and then we iterate over all of the controllers that are in the field. So we only have one controller, one player, so this will only iterate once. Then we have an if expression that does a couple of different detections. One is whether the user is pressing the right action or the left action. These pieces of code are very similar, so I'll go over one of them. If the user is intending to move to the right, then we take the clamped value for the platformer action right, multiply it by 300, and multiply it by the time delta seconds. The clamped value is a value from zero to one. So if you're using say a joystick, for example, you could be at 0.5. And the delta seconds is because our frames per second or the amount of time that we've taken to process or any number of things could happen. And we want to move the character the same distance in those amounts of times that vary. So we multiply by delta seconds to figure out how far we should move the character given the amount of time that has passed. The controller has this translation field that we talked about earlier. And what I've been doing here, which is a little bit verbose, but is very clear in my opinion, is we I've been setting the translation on the controller, which again is the difference between where we are and where we want to be. 
by matching on the controller.translation. The controller.translation doesn't necessarily need to exist, so it could be none or some here. If it's some, that means we do have a VEC2 to deal with. And because we're only dealing with the horizontal velocity, I mutably set x to the right-hand speed that we calculated earlier, and then return those values. If we have none, that means we haven't touched the horizontal velocity yet, and we can construct a new VEC2 representing the horizontal and vertical components. The same thing happens if the user wants to go left, except it's negative for a value instead of positive. And finally, because we do need to have some defaults, because we need to handle gravity ourselves, for example, if nothing else is happening and there's no other user input, we set the horizontal velocity to zero. If there has been no input up until this point, we set the horizontal velocity to zero, as well as the vertical component to negative four. I don't know that negative four is the right gravity for this game, but it is a number that I've been using for the example. And then we do the same thing for the jump. And the way these two systems interact, one of these systems can set this velocity value, this VEC2, and the other one has to deal with that. So you can end up with, for example, the jump system running. And because it has a none for the translation of the controller, we can set that value to whatever we want. In this case, we're using a jump value of 20. It's a single smooth parabolic arc. So we'll want to make that more complicated in the future. But notice that we've set the horizontal velocity and the vertical velocity. So once we've done that, the horizontal system down here, then we'll get a sum value uh, of vec2 to deal with rather than getting none. But overall, that's the character controller. I haven't come up with a way that I really like using it yet, but I will make sure to let you know when I do, because this is, I feel like, a very powerful addition to the like bevy ecosystem. It makes it significantly easier to do things like ground detection and whether you should jump or not, for example. And it has all these other features that we went over today that are just things that you shouldn't have to write from scratch if you're trying to do like a 2D platformer that we did actually have to write from scratch as we started building this example. So super excited about that. Hopefully we'll get the 0.9 versions of all of these libraries sometime next week. And I will catch you in the next video. If you have any questions about character controllers or what's going on, Leave them in the comments as usual and have a great day.